Welcome to Bea Leading Voices. This engaging forum of Bea's Leading Voices features groundbreaking discoveries, new research at the nation's historically black colleges and universities, HBCUs, and winners of the HBCU STEM Innovation Awards. Game-changing innovators at HBCUs are recognized each year at the annual Bea STEM Conference. And now, Bea Leading Voices. Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Danae Thomas Mwendwa. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me tonight to speak on a topic that I'm sure we all are very familiar with, and that is can you hear? stress. Uh, by show of hands, how many of you out here can say that you have to deal with stress on a daily basis? Oh, 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 okay. <laughs> all right, <laughs> okay. Well, the wonderful thing is, I guess, that you're not alone. According to the organization that I belong to, the American Psychological Association, they poll every year uh, respondents who uh, annually talk about stress. And they, 74% uh, of the respondents say that they uh, endorse at least one symptom that is associated with stress. So what do I mean by a symptom? Headaches, muscle fatigue, pain, insomnia, GI problems, probably some of these things that I'm having right now, okay? <laughs> and now 45% uh, state that they lay awake at night, uh, can't sleep. Anybody here with that? It's called insomnia. And then 37% say that they eat unhealthy and overeat because of stress, meaning we snack on sweets and we consume fatty, fatty foods. Um, some of the top sources of stress that have been reported are work for the students in here, school, finances, health-related concerns, and interpersonal problems. Now, before I really talk about the effects of stress on health, I think it's important to mention some of the key aspects of stress. The first is that we as researchers on stress cannot agree on one definition. Now that's not uncommon in the social sciences. I'm sorry for you STEM folks, but this is what we do. <laughs> but what we do agree on is that there is one physiological stress response that does not differentiate between what is a physical stress and what is a psychological stress. It's also important to note that stress can indeed be positive or negative. When it's positive, it helps to motivate us to do better, like, for instance, to perform well on an exam. I'm a professor, I'm gonna use a lot of exam uh, uh, examples. Then there's negative stress, and in this case, it causes distress. The last point I want to make about stress is that it involves perception. And what I mean by that is how one thinks about their stress, and then ultimately how they feel as though they can cope with their stress. Now, as a health psychologist, I'm concerned with both the physiological responses to stress because that has a direct impact on health. And then, of course, I am also a clinical health psychologist. So dealing with perceptions about health and one's ability to believe that they can deal with it is the avenues in which I hopefully can be an effective change agent to bring about behavior change. Now, the physiological stress response all starts here in the brain. And for acute stress, we call on a, the sympathetic nervous system. Is everybody familiar with the sympathetic nervous system? Where there is this release of epinephrine and norepinephrine 
to ready the body for the fight or flight response, okay? Typically, that type of a response is for acute stress. And your body pretty much goes back to homeostasis. Now, for us, while we are indeed interested in acute stress, for what it is that I do, I'm more interested in the system that deals with chronic stress, or what we call long-lasting stress. And that is, you ready for this? The hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. That's a mouthful. It's also called the HPA axis for short. Now, this particular system uh, contains the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the adrenal glands. Now, think of the hypothalamus as the command center that is ultimately responsible for the release of these hormones. They eventually make their way down to the adrenal glands at the top of our kidneys that releases the stress hormone cortisol. Everybody I'm sure in here has heard about cortisol. Okay, cortisol is very helpful in mobilizing the body to produce energy to meet the demands of the stress. Now, a long-term stress, okay, is, well, what I had to do to prepare for this talk tonight, <laughs> okay? But with that long-term stress, there is hopefully an end in sight and such that I will be off the stage and it's over, okay? Well, when it's over, that cortisol that's given me that energy to do what I'm doing up here right now needs to ultimately shut off, okay? And we refer to that as a negative feedback loop, okay? However, under chronic stress, let's just say you have to deal with a family member that is suffering from cancer, and then on top of everything, you have to still do your everyday job, Okay, with chronic stress, there really isn't necessarily an end in sight. So what happens is there's a wear and tear on that very shutoff mechanism, which leads to what we call excess circulating cortisol. Okay, now cortisol really does play a fundamental role. It helps us metabolize Okay, so it's influential in metabolization. It also reduces inflammation, and it helps with memory formation. So when there is an overabundance of cortisol circulating in our bodies as a consequence of this disruption, this can lead to long-term health problems, problems such as heart disease, hypertension, dyslipidemia, obesity, and then on top of that, other mental health disorders such as depression and anxiety. Well, now that I probably have depressed you about the fact that <laughs> I wouldn't be a clinical psychologist if I didn't do that, um, that I depressed you about the circulating cortisol that is in our bodies, I want to leave on an upswing. Okay, stress is a part of our everyday experience. It is it's unavoidable, but we can learn to deal with it. We can embrace it by learning to manage it. So I know it doesn't sound so easy, and trust me, it's not, considering how I was about two hours ago trying to practice this talk, it was really bad. I mean, it was really bad. Um, but I did myself go outside and practice some relaxation techniques to help me cope with this stressor so I could manage what it is that I had to do tonight. So, this is my shameless plug. Uh, at Howard University, I am currently doing a research on African-American women who are at risk for cardiovascular disease. And we are developing a uh, intervention 
for stress reduction. And we're using a type of meditation called mindfulness. How many people in here have called, heard the term mindfulness? It seems to be all over the place. But um, the mindfulness definition that I want to use is by Cabot Zen, who is um, at the University of Massachusetts. And it involves bringing one's complete attention to the present experience on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. It is present-oriented consciousness that is non-judgmental and involves an awareness of each thought, feeling, and sensation. So what does all that mean? It's about being, not doing. Non-striving versus striving. Okay, intentional versus automatic. The best way to think of it is a mundane task that you all do. Mine is brushing my teeth. We just do some mundane tasks without really being aware of what we're doing. With mindfulness, it's about being, being aware of the things that we just automatically do, okay, and embracing those. <clears throat> Earlier, by a show of hands, we acknowledged that we all experience a little bit of stress in our lives. It is my hope that this talk can kind of give you an idea that there are techniques out there that you could utilize to reduce your stress. Thank you for your time. Have a good evening. Thank you for joining us for this video presentation of Bea Leading Voices. This program was recorded at the 2019 Bayer STEM Conference held at the Marriott Boardman Park in Washington, D.C. For more on Bayer's leading voices, please subscribe to U.S. Black Engineer in IT Magazine or visit www.blackengineer.com. To learn about the Bayer STEM Conference, visit www.bayer.org.